Yeah, hello, um, police. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, police. I'd like to report a missing beard. This is the sound from the Osmo action. So I would say that works pretty well. So in today's video, I'll be looking at this fantastic piece of kit. It's the Korg Nano Control Studio Mobile MIDI Controller. Looks beautiful, doesn't it? The other thing, it worked perfectly in Premiere. So I've worked as an editor for 20 years and in the post-production world, you get to see all the, the onliners and the mixers and the graders all playing with really interesting control surfaces. As an editor, you're really, your keyboard is the main bit of kit that you rely on. I've been doing more and more of these YouTube videos and other projects as well, like music videos and things like that. I thought to myself, is there anything out there that would enable me to take control of Premiere? And I found this, the Korg Nano Control Studio. It was about $100 in terms of build quality. It's, it's light, yes. It, it's, it's plastic, yes. As you can see, the studio mixer has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight faders on it in the same amount of pan pots. Uh, the buttons are very nice. They're backlit, as you've seen, and when you haven't used it for a little while, it puts on a nice little show for you. It does work really well, and I'm gonna walk you through the processes of, first of all, preparing a video for mixing, and then I'm gonna show you how to set up the Korg Nano Control Studio so it works absolutely beautifully with Premiere. So the best thing that happened to me when I started editing was I spent about a month working very closely with a dubbing mixer. Seeing how an audio professional works and likes their tracks laid out really has informed the way that I edit. And that's really what I'm gonna talk about now is the, the idea of track laying, laying out your tracks. For, in my case, it's for passing it on to someone who's going to do the mixing. But in terms of these videos that I produce, I apply the same skills that that dubbing mixer taught me back in 1998. I apply those sort of fundamental rules and etiquette of laying out a timeline to what I do now. So if we have a look on Premiere, you can see I've got a sequence here, and this is actually for my next video, so a little sneaky peek. And this is for uh, a gimbal that I was reviewing. What I've got here, I've got four tracks of audio. And on audio track one, I've got all my dialogue. If I play that now. We've come to Dunstan Castle. Um, and it's uh, beautiful. I just wanted to put it on a bit of a Manfrotto monopod. That's not mixed, so the music's too loud. It needs sorting out. On track two, we have all the Atmos and that is the, the sound that the camera picked up. So that goes on track two. And then on track three, same again, as you can see on the timeline here, if I just zoom in a bit, what I tend to do is I check a board. So you can see here, that piece of uh, audio runs under me talking. That's what putting certain sound on tracks enables you to do. And especially when you're using a control surface like this one, if you clearly know what your tracks are in terms of the faders, so I know one will always be dialogue, two will always be Atmos, three will always be Atmos, and number four, track number four is music. Because I've used this sort of checkerboarding of my audio, I can very simply find a space where it's not gonna clash with something else. So that's basically the layout. And you can obviously expand that. If you've got more audio tracks or if you've got more people speaking, I would recommend that you give each person talking their own track. Often when cameras are shooting on location, you get split track audio. So you've got one person, a contributor, talking on track one, and then the second person, the other contributor, is on track two. So it just gives you that separation of sound and then I would keep that entirely through a scene. And if you apply that logic, if say you've got eight tracks and then you're working on a video which then gets passed on to someone who's going to mix it, if they can 
see that logic throughout. They know that the dialogue is on tracks one and two, they know the Atmos is on three and four, and they know that the musics are on four, five, six. What that does for me is it ensures that what you are passing on to them and what they mix is going to be as close as I intend it to be. So they're not having to move things around or, or reinterpret like where does they want the Atmos to finish. You are giving them a really close approximation of what you want this to sound like when it goes on TV or goes online or goes to the client. The same thing applies. So keeping this logic to your audio tracks has really stood me in good stead. Now that I've got a control surface, I've found it's been really smooth sailing and it's really sped up my workflow. When you haven't got a control surface and you're doing everything manually and you're having to add keyframes and drop Atmoses and then uh, have a listen. And then maybe, maybe you would go, okay, well, at this point where someone speaks, Okay, so today we... You would put keyframes in and you would drop the audio down. Okay, so today we've come... And then you come back and think, okay, that music could be a little bit louder and the fade could be a bit longer, and then so you drag that in. Okay, so today we've come to Dunster Castle. So when you're mixing and you're using keyframes, sure you can do it, but using a control surface I found that you do get a more sort of organic input. It, it, the mix sounds a lot more natural. It's also a lot faster. So how do you set up the Korg Nano Control Studio to work with Premiere? I'll tell you this, it did take a couple of hours and it was very frustrating, but once you've cracked it and once you've, you've got it all talking nicely, it is, it's a joy to use. If you look through the PDF manual of this, you'll see that the device itself can start up in several different modes. So I plugged it in and I was excited to use it, but I couldn't get Premiere to talk to the device and it was really frustrating. I was going through the manual, which is a PDF, and it wasn't working. And I found one setting which the a couple of the buttons would just jump to cut and I thought this it's got to be better than this it's got to work and I kept going and kept going and kept going and restarting Premiere and plugging this in pressing different buttons depending on what I was reading in the manual I couldn't find anything and then I went onto the forums and found that if you press the set marker button that one just there and the record button as the device turns on. So that's the set marker button and the record button. It boots up in Mackie mode. And then all you do is you go into preferences and you go to control surface and your device appears just there and all your buttons work. So on this, we've got a jog shuttle. So you've got the jog shuttle, which gives you frame by frame ability to scrub through and find the exact frame that you want. You've also got play, stop, and then backwards. Having set it up and got all the buttons working and knowing that it's working perfectly in terms of talking to the software, I hit a snag. There are two interfaces for mixing your sequence when you're in Adobe Premiere. You can either do it in the track mixer, which is this one here, and what this is doing is it's writing keyframes to the actual track, not the clips. It will not be altering the volume of the clip, it will be altering the volume of the track. So I prefer to use clip mixing because you then see the keyframes on the clips themselves and also you can then move a track of music and the mix moves with it. Now, when I play through here on my timeline, I was hoping that I would, everything else is working, all the buttons are working, the jog shuttle's working, but I was seeing no input. What, it's, it's, oh, it's broken, or I'm gonna have to learn to love the track mixer. But then I had a little click around and I'm in the audio clip mixer here. And then we go into the little drop down menu. And then I saw this. 
Hallelujah. Toggle control surface, clip mixer mode. Boom, I was off. And if we look at the mixing panel over here, this is the clip mixer, play through. Suddenly, I can change the audio levels. Fantastic. But then you look at this, you check that you are looking at clip keyframes, not track keyframes. Where are the keyframes? Well, there's another little button you've got to check. You've got to set this to right keyframes up here. Then if we go back to the top, click play, you can see there's some uh, bigger sound coming up here. So I'm going to prepare to lift it up a little bit. Keyframes all over the place. So there we go, using the right keyframe button and enabling the toggle control surface clip mixer mode. Now I'm clip mixing. You can see that the faders are moving when I move this and I've got control over my sequence. It took a little bit of fiddle faffing to set up, but once you get there and it's working, it is a really useful bit of kit. I'm really glad I picked it up. The only thing that I've added, as you can see here, is that I've added a strip with numbers on it because underneath here there's no there's no number or anything. So I've just stuck a bit of um, gaffer tape on there just so I can visually just quickly go to go to it. In the first couple of weeks, that just builds up your sort of muscle memory with the mixer and I find that useful. So I'm just gonna mute, mute the music here just so we can listen to the dialogue. Okay, so today we've come to Dunster Castle um, and it's uh... it's all up and downy. So what I'm going to do is step in here so we can see what's going on. Go. Got some keyframes on there that I want to sort of fix, and I've got a little bit of run in there. So I'll see if I've got any more on that. Yep, got lots of that. So that just gives me a little bit of an opportunity to find the fader and then get it to a level. Again, I'm not too worried about the levels because I'm going to put a compressor on this and a limiter but I just basically wanted to have a nice mix with the Atmos underneath, which on this point is another river. I'll do it in layers. I'll go through. Okay, so today we've come to Dunster Castle. Find my level. So my level's about there. So now I know if I go back, I can go back. Okay, so today we've come to Dunster Castle um, and it's... Uh... Beautiful. I just wanted to put it on a bit of a man photo monopod to see what I could get. It's now raining, but so there we go. I'll go through and I'll do that for the whole sequence and you get to see that the next week because that's my next video. But I am massively impressed with the Korg Nano Control Studio. It's really sped up the mixing process and it feels more organic. It does what it says. It takes a little bit of setting up and a bit of fiddle faffing, but once you're there, once you know that you've got to have your right buttons turned on, you've got to be in the right mode in either the clip or the track mixer, and you've checked all your levels and you've laid out your tracks correctly, and you know that you are ready to mix, it will speed you up in terms of how fast you can mix a sequence. It's, it's a physical thing on my desk that when I move a button, it moves a fader. I mean, that's entertaining on its own. And when you turn it off, you get a little light show like this. So down in the comments, have you found any sort of control surfaces that have transformed your workflow? I'd love to hear because I've been looking on Amazon and they cost a lot of money, the really impressive ones. For, for now, for what I'm doing on here, I'm massively impressed with the Korg Nano Control Studio. Right, so you've seen a little sneak peek of the video that I'm doing next. It's the Hohem iSteady Pro 2. It's water resistant and we did get rained on. The question is, did it survive? Tune in next time, you'll find out. I've been Andy, you've been great. Thanks for watching.